Venezuela closes its airspace to any aircraft coming from or going to Argentina until that nation compensates Emtrasur for the thief and subsequent destruction of one of its planes. The Colombian Supreme Court of Justice elected Luz Adriana Camargo as the new Attorney General of the nation. At least one civilian was killed in Lebanon as part of Israeli attacks on the east of the country. Hello and welcome to From the South. I'm Alejandra Garcia from Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Venezuelan Foreign Ministry announced the closing of its country's airspace to any aircraft coming from or going to Argentina until that nation compensates Emtrasur for the thief and subsequent destruction of one of its planes. The government of Venezuela pointed out that Argentina intends to ignore the consequences of its acts and of piracy and thief. Last February, Caracas denounced before the international community the violation of the international law by the U.S. and Argentinian governments for the thief of an aircraft belonging to the state company Conviasa. The plane was re retained in Buenos Aires since June 2022 and sent to the United States last February where it was vandalized. The Bolivarian government condemned these actions as posing a threat to the region's aviation security, emphasizing that it will take legal and diplomatic measures to safeguard the country's rights over its patrimonial assets. Through his social network, the foreign minister Ivan Hill expressed the neo-Nazi government of Argentina is not only submissive and obedient to, the, to its imperial master, but it has a shameless spokesperson, Mr. Manuel Adorni, who pretends to ignore the consequences of his acts of piracy and thief against Venezuela, which were warned repeatedly because of the criminal acts committed against Emtrasur. Likewise, the diplomat detailed that Venezuela exercises full sovereignty in its airspace and reiterates that no aircraft coming from or heading to Argentina will be able to fly over our territory until our company is duly compensated for the damage caused after the illegal actions carried out only in order to please their northern tutors. Venezuela's declarations come after Argentina's presidential spokesman Manuel Adorni announced that his government will take diplomatic actions against the government of Caracas. Adorni, however, did not specify what the measures against Venezuela will be. The spokesman of the Argentinian presidency said that Caracas' decision is part of an alleged reprisal for the confiscation of a Venezuelan aircraft by Argentina and said to the United States a fact that the Bolivarian authorities denounce as illegal. The Colombian Supreme Court of Justice elected Luz Adriana Camargo as the new Attorney General of the nation. The selection was made after meeting for the fifth time in an extraordinary session with 18 votes in favor, 6 over and 12 required in a short list that was made up only of women. Camargo will succeed the questioned former prosecutor Francisco Barbosa, who ended his term on February 12 amidst strong criti criticisms for the high level of impunity during his administration. Camargo will lead the prosecutor's office for four years. The Supreme Court of Justice informs the country that in the extraordinary session of the full court held today, Dr. Luz Adriana Camargo was elected as the new Attorney General of the nation. Kenyan authorities assured they will delay the deployment of their police forces in Haiti after Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry announced his resignation. According to the government of Kenya, the Haitian Prime Minister's resignation has led to a change in circumstances which will delay the deployment of 1,000 Kenyan security agents. Authorities also assured that the military contingent will be sent when a new government is structured in the Caribbean nation. Port au Prince has been experiencing an escalation of violence for several weeks, which has caused the displacement of over 15,000 people. 
In Cuba, a book about the history of the ALBA Alliance written by the Bolivian politician and diplomat Sasha Llorenti and the rector of the Higher Institute of International Relations, Rogelio Sierra, was presented on Tuesday at the Fidel Castro Ruz Center in Havana. The book entitled The Foreign of an Alliance, The History of ALBA TCP and Its Struggle for Latin American Caribbean Integration, published by Politica Internacional, was described by its authors as a reference material for diplomats, professors and students. The text includes the history of the unity attempts of the independence heroes in Latin America up to the foundation of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Am our America on December 14, 2004, by two leaders of the region, Commanders Hugo Chavez Frias and Fidel Castro Ruz. The authors outlined in their presentation how ALBA is a paradigm of integration in the face of the threats that humanity faces today. The book tries to gather not only the history of ALBA, which is very important, because our roots are deep in Martí, Bolívar and Sandino, but also how to face the challenges of the present, for example, the pandemic, the climate crisis, and the world and the international organizations can learn a lot from ALBA. I hope this book will be read by trade unions, students, workers, because that's what ALBA is. ALBA is an alliance for our peoples. Para nuestros pueblos. The current rector of the Institute of International Relations of Cuba, Rogelio Sierra Díaz, considered the work as a reference text for current diplomats and students of this specialty. Este texto permite for young Cubans who are being trained in international relations, cubanos que se están formando en las relaciones to drink from a serious, direct, and very committed source with ALBA. Eh, seria, about what this alliance has been for the peoples of our America and will allow them to discover things that maybe do not appear in the newspapers or that are not read in them or better yet to unmask many publications that misrepresent what ALBA has been for the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates and more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Israeli occupation forces killed nine Palestinians waiting for humanitarian aid in the northern Gaza Strip. Tel Aviv forces opened fire on Palestinians who were near the Kuwait roundabout waiting for the arrival of humanitarian aid. According to local media, the Israeli aggression left nine people dead and some 20 people wounded. Official sources warned that after this massacre, the number of people killed while waiting, waiting for humanitarian aid has, rise, has risen to 400, while 1,300 have been wounded. According to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, this, this type of attack against civilians has become a common practice by the Israeli occupation. Likewise, the Tel Aviv regime continues orchestrating its incursions into all the Palestinian territories despite the beginning of Ramadan. The Palestinian Health Ministry reiterated that several victims remain under the rubble and on the roads as the occupation prevents ambulances and civil protection teams from breaching them. The entity also detailed that in these 158 days of aggression, the number of dead reached more than 31,000 and a total of 72,889 wounded, of which 72% are women and children.
At least one civilian was killed in Lebanon as part of Israeli attacks on the east of the country. The civil defense teams also reported an attack by Tel Aviv against a building in the center of the town of Nabi Shit. According to the report, the occupying entity has been carrying out air attacks since Monday against civil infrastructures in the region surrounding the city of Ansar, in addition to missile raids against the localities in the south of the country. Experts warn that the Israeli forces are seeking to extend their offensive towards Lebanon as a way of advancing in the occupation of territories and keeping Premier Benjamin Netanyahu in power. Russia, Iran and China carry out the joint naval drills Maritime Security Belt 2024 in the Gulf of Oman to promote cooperation and world peace. The Russian Ministry of Defense reported the arrival of several ships from his country to the Iranian port of Chabahar and said that representatives from Oman, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Pakistan and South Africa are participating as observers in these exercises. The drills are intended to strengthen security in the region, promote collective cooperation and demonstrate the ability of nations to provide concerted support to each other to achieve world peace. A man died Tuesday in Argentina amid storms that flooded part of Buenos Aires and its surroundings. The Buenos Aires Civil Defense confirmed that the victim was a middle-aged man whose body remained floating for hours in one of the flooded streets in the town of Valentina Sina, in the outskirts of the capital city. The storm has caused flight delays, left vehicles underwater and prevented businesses from opening, triggering a red alert across the area. There were also some power outages reported and trains operated with reduced frequency, while some services were cancelled due to weather conditions. The storms began on Sunday night and, according to the National Meteorological Service, will last until Thursday. The government of the city of Buenos Aires reported that more than 125 millimeters of rain had fallen until Tuesday, a record figure in the last 30 years and 20 millimeters above the average forecast for the whole month of March. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology warned on, on Tuesday about the observation of volcanic haze in the caldera of Tal volcano, which is affecting several areas of the city of Batangas. The entity stated that the Tal volcano is in alert level 1 after emitting around 6,837 tons of sulfur dioxide. Moreover, it registered a volcanic tremor that lasted two minutes. The director of the Philippine Institute, Teresito Balcolcol, called on citizens to take precautions at against this air pollution by wearing face masks, drinking plenty of water and minimizing outdoor activities. Meanwhile, entry to the island of Tal Volcano is prohibited as sudden steam driving eruptions, earthquakes or lethal gas, gas vents could threaten the area. We have a final short break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly and share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin America and the Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Russian Defense Ministry reported on Tuesday that a military transport plane crashed in the province of Ivanovov. There were 15 people on board. According to the Defense Ministry, the EIL-76 military aircraft was carrying eight crew members and seven passengers at the time of the accident. The event occurred a few minutes after takeoff when one of its engines got fired. Military sources said the crew made an effort to prevent the burning plane from crashing into populated areas. Investigations are underway to clarify the causes of the accident.
The Russian army claims to have repelled all attacks from Ukraine on the border of the Russian Belgorod region. The army says that the incursion attempts were made in three directions from the settlement of Old Norvika, as well as near the Russian settlements of Nekotlevka and Spodachino in the Belgorod region. Through the self-sacrificing actions of Russian servicemen, all attacks of Ukrainian terrorist groups have been repelled. The enemy was hit by operational tactical, army aviation, missile forces, artillery and heavy flamethrower systems. Around 3 o'clock in the morning, after intense shelling of civilian objects, Ukrainian terrorist groups, with the support of tanks and armored combat vehicles, attempted to make incursions into Russian territory in three directions, from the settlement of Obnorovivka of the Kharkiv region, as well as in the areas of the settlement of Nekotyevka and Spodayushino in the Belgorod region. The two sessions are the most important annual political event in China and are taking place at this moment. The session is crucial for the analysis and evaluation of China's performance in the different sectors. Let's see more details in the following report. The two sessions are China's most important annual political event. They refer to the meetings of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference and of the National Popular Congress. The Consultative Conference is an advisory body made up of more than 2,000 people divided into 34 groups that, in addition to the Chinese Communist Party, include representatives from the other eight parties present in China and sectors ranging from science and technology to religion. For its part, the Congress is the legislative body of China and has almost 3,000 members both have five-year terms. In addition to the annual national meeting, popular congresses are held at different levels, such as township, county, city, and provincial levels throughout the year. In different villages, towns, there are different liaison offices, deputy liaison offices. So there, uh, people can go to those offices, meet their deputies, and bring their issues to them. Uh, and also, this, most of the deputies live among the people, they live in the villages, they know what's going on. So I can give you a number, by 2020, at the end of 2020, uh, 2.6 million people have worked as a deputy to the People's Congresses at all levels. And more than 90% are at village and township levels. That means most of the deputies across China are at a grassroots grassroots levels. They know the concerns of grassroots people. So it means think of the number and think of the level they're at. They can reflect the problem from bottom to up. The two sessions are democratic and unified. Why do I say this? As you can see, representatives of China's 56 ethnic groups meet here to discuss national issues. We set the tone for new policies and changes at the national level all year long here at two sessions. This allows us to have an overview of the development of the entire country and society and is very important for us. We are representatives at the community level and are participating participation is part of true democracy. Forecasted by a range of economic experts, China's GDP growth target for this year was set again at 5%. The most topical issue in these two sessions has been the priority of the concept of new quality productive forces. In a press conference, Zhang Yuzhuo, president of the Assets Supervision and Administration Commission of the State Council, highlighted that the goal is to modernize and not abandon traditional industries. The most important thing is to advance industrial modernization. Central state-owned enterprises have a relatively large presence in traditional competitive industries. Now is the time to use new technologies to transform traditional industries, improve their efficiency, and make them smart, high-end, and green. There have been many significant achievements in this regard. We have more than 100 smart factories. Recently, some central state-owned enterprises have cooperated with Huawei to achieve automation and unmanned and intelligent operation in coal mines. As a result, there is no need for human labor in coal mining 
ensuring fundamental safety. Journalist and political analyst Li Jingjing points out that the economy is not the only priority in the two sessions. Several deputies uh, proposed that we need to build a stronger workforce to take care of the elderly. And now what happened? The government has sent uh, a group of staff to 20, more than 20 provinces and 42 villages across China to do field research, to do what's happening, what, what we need to do, how to build a stronger workforce for the elderly. So I mean, those, those deputies do make a difference because all their bills, all their proposals will be carefully reviewed at the national level and it will be carefully de deliberated, reviewed, and carried out. I think that's a perfect chance for everybody to understand China's real political system. From Beijing for Telesur, Mauro Ramos from TVT Brazil. We have come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net and join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok as well. For Telesur English, I'm Alejandra Garcia. Thank you for watching.